I'm super excited to have my good friend Eric Kalman on the show today. This has been in the works for a while and we finally made it happen. Eric is an absolute legend. He helped create campaigns such as Old Spice as the man your man could smell like, as well as the celebrated work for Skittles, Coca-Cola, Kayak, Ragu, Little Caesars, Career Builder, and many, many others. Before co-founding his agency, Eric and Coleman, Eric was executive creative director of Goodby Silverstein and Partners. And before that, he was the founding executive creative director of Barton F. Graff. And before that, Eric was at Wyden and Kennedy Portland, where his work for Old Spice won the Grand Effie. And before that, he was at Shiat, New York. And before that, he was just a funny guy. And before that, he was in his mommy's belly. In 2011, he was the most awarded creative in the world. He has won 28 Can Lions, including both the film and Cyber Grand Prix. He's won an Emmy, and his eight yellow pencils and two black pencils make him the third most awarded copywriter in DNAD history. Let's give it up for Eric Kalman, everybody. Well, it's your lucky day, you headphone wearing bastard, because Jason Bagley's podcast is here. Oh, yeah. He's going to interview the most important person, so shut your mouth and f***ing open your ears. Yes, it's Jason's podcast, the best you can get anywhere. And if you pay a attention, you'll get your mind blown. But I should probably tone it down because Jason Bagley wouldn't want me to swear. Yes, it's Jason Bagley's podcast, baby. You better get out your notebook and your pen. He'll interview a mother important person. God damn it, I did it again. It's Jason's podcast. Here we go. All right. Eric Coleman, my dear friend, welcome hey. to the show. Thanks, Jason. From the backyard, I am, you asked where I was before we got on, Eric said, where are you, in a Motel 6? I am not in a Motel 6. I am in the childhood bedroom of my wife, Parmas, in Woodland Hills, California. Literally coming to you globally, live, from Parmas' childhood bedroom. Woodland Hills, where is that about? Woodland Hills is right next to Calabasas. I can the- say it's. I can say it's a Kardashian country, right? Like not far from Thousand Oaks. Yeah, it's right, right by, right near Kardashian country. Gotcha. K dash center of the universe. All that's so, important. Everything that matters. Yes. We. So we met many years ago, and little could any of us have predicted the special and magical ride that would uh, occur relatively relatively quickly after you and Craig got to widen. Um, we started working together on uh, Career Builder as a, as a threesome. And then in the middle of that project, I got promoted to be creative director, which was very intimidating. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. And suddenly I'm creative directing this rock star team from uh, Shiat. And uh, wow, what a ride we had. Why did it do well? Did Old Spice do well? Uh, Old Spice, uh, (laughs) just to update you, it did okay. Oh, thank God. (laughs) I just wanted to hit the numbers for P&G. For my people in Cincinnati, hit those numbers. Yeah, no. It was wild. It was wild. Yeah, it's very fun. Uh, we had a good time working together for many years, and then you went off to uh, help launch BFG and continue to do phenomenal work. And now, tell us where you're at. What what agency do you work for? Who do you work for, Eric? I work for, I work for uh, a creative agency in San Francisco called Eric and Coleman, named after uh, both my surname. Is your surname your first name or your last name? I have no idea. I think it might be your last name. Okay. I think it's your last name. Yeah. Well, my partner's name is Steve Eric, and so that really worked out, you know. <laughs> it really worked out for you. Eric and Kalman, you know, decades down the line, if we're owned by a giant conglomerate, it'll be hard to fire Eric Kalman from Eric and Kalman. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it'll be good. Um, but, yeah, you guys have managed to – it's no easy task to launch an agency and – You've managed to do very well and continue to do great work, um, keeping Thank keeping you. the world keeping the world smiling, which I appreciate. 
Thank you. So everybody listening, here and try to go work. Uh, see if you can get a job at Eric and Coleman. It's a fun place. Yeah. Uh, but. Well, what'd you bring me here to talk about today, Jason? So today, glad you brought that up. Uh, one of the things in my course that creatives ask a lot about very wisely, they're very wise to ask this question is, as we all know, media has shifted over, you know, been quite a while, but it just continues to shift to where more and more of the media buys that happen are sixes and 15s. And so they present both a unique challenge and opportunity. That's the positive spin on it. Um, and creators want to know, like, what, how do you do it? You know, how do you make a great piece of creative in just 15 seconds? And so I thought, I'm going to get my buddy, Eric Coleman, who has done uh, as many great 15s as anybody. And we're going to talk about how to make great 15s. And we don't really have a plan here. We don't have a plan. We're just going to oh, watch some spots, talk about it. Make it up as we go, you know? Let's do it. Well, you know, Jay, I think you started in advertising, you know, close to about where I did within a few years. And it was funny because I feel like we've seen the total evolution of this where I remember the, you know, the older creatives in my first job, you know, not wanting to work on brands that just would do a couple 30s and 15s. You know what I mean? They were like 30s were the throwaway. They just wanted to do 60s. Yeah. yeah. And then they had to they had to do a few 30s. Um, and then it evolved into thirties and fifteens were like a staple. Um, yeah. And then it's gotten insane now where, you know, a lot of, you know, maybe a lot of CPGs especially are, are doing, uh, fifteens as the long form. Yeah. And then you, you pick up some sixes. So it's, uh, it's still a lot of fun, but it's wild how condensed it's got. And I think it is. It is, yeah, I, I, this, it's, a lot of times the 30 is like the long form and you're like, uh, you're hoping you get to do a 30. Um, yeah. But at the same time, I think it, it, they present a unique challenge. But there's something that I love about a great 15. And I don't know, what is the magic of a great 15? Is it that that when it when you pull it off, there's something so delightful and magical about such a condensed smart like no i don't think i don't think anyone expects to see something that works and that is actually entertaining or funny in such a quick short period well yeah i mean i would say that's exactly it i would say the reason why great 15s almost feel better to you than great 30s is you know you know uh, something hilarious or amazing to look at, right? That happens. Usually you're building towards it for a whole 30 seconds. You know what I mean? And then you pay them off at the end with it. Uh, just getting right to the point. Um, you know, if that point is great enough, I think it's like, it's just better. You don't waste anybody's time. Um, and, and think about every great commercial is a simple idea. Like you can explain what happens in 15 seconds easy, right? Like, Jason, you did one of my favorite Nike spots ever where you have the offensive player and the defensive player running towards each other from each side, you know, throughout their lives until they finally are together on the same field and hit each other. Like that, obviously, you want the time so you can build, you know what I mean? But I feel like, uh, you know, if you're just going to show something amazing that doesn't take that long or if you're going to make a joke that's hopefully pretty great, it doesn't take that long, you don't need that time. So if you can reward people faster, I think it's pretty cool. I think it's more, maybe it's just more impressive too. It's like, what's more impressive? Somebody carving a swan out of an ice, out of a chunk of ice in three hours or in f 10 minutes? Like they're both, they're both a, a beautiful melting swan, but if you can do it, I don't know. There's something just like it, you achieve the same thing in less time, which makes it even more impressive. So, uh, you want to, you want to talk about a spot? You want to play a spot and talk yeah, about Yeah, let me see if I can share on your uh, complicated uh, recording interface. Yeah, watch the first two. Watch the Skittles one and then watch the iRobot one. Okay. $300. $300? 
Or you can buy your Skittles at some other store around here. Value the rainbow. Taste the rainbow. Jim Shorts ahead, sir. Navigate around. What? Navigate around. What? What? Navigate around. What? Go around. Has recognized and avoided more objects than any other robot. iRobot OS. That first one, that Skittles Cloud commercial, was the fifth, first 15 I ever did. I did with Craig. And back then, no one wrote original 15s. You know what I mean? It was just a cut down of a 30. And if it had to require an extra line captured to condense the story, you know what I mean? That would be the most people did. So we were very lucky to work for two CDs who were very big into a 15 can be as good as a 30. It should be its own thing. It's totally different own story, um, which was kind of a, a novel concept back in like the mid 2000s when we did that uh, cloud spot. And uh, I think it carries through to today like that iRobot 15, um, you know, that's the latest campaign we just did, or one of the latest ones at our agency. And, you know, it's just, I know now it's more of the, you know, the, the standard media by involves 15, but people still just cut down 30s too much. And so when we went and made whatever it was, three or four, 30s for iRobot, we also made sure to make unique 15s with different stories, just because it's a chance to make something good, just as good as a 30. Uh, so I think maybe there's still a lot of uh, people out there who, who don't see it that way and are kind of treated as a throwaway. But like we were talking about earlier, we know now 15s can be great, right? So it can be better than your 30, and oftentimes, sometimes is. <clears throat> yeah, and I like that point that it, it should you really should strive to have it be its own thing and not a cut down because they they work differently. Like you have to, you got to tell that story differently that the iRobot one, it, for some reason, it doesn't even feel like a 15. It feels longer. And I think yeah. it's because the tension, because the way you you build the tension in the control room somehow makes it, uh, feel like that couldn't have happened in 15 seconds yeah for sure i think that's another thing that's happened over time is that like creatives and especially directors have gotten their heads around 15 you can still i mean you can't do it like a 30 or a 60 right but you can still there's you know there's still storytelling you know elements that can happen like you can build right you can build in in a story you can build tension you can set things up like I don't know. I think maybe over the last decade where everyone's dove in and been used to making 15s, um, you know, you get your head around it. It's maybe a little more time than you originally thought back in the day. Ladies, does the fresh scent of Fiji make your man smell like a never-ending tropical sunset? Personalized love song melody? Romantic puppy surprise? Yes. By the way, I remember all the all the drama around that spot <clears throat> with the puppies. But um, oh, puppy and a guitar, yeah, not good. Yeah, the uh, <laughs> that was a funny story where we had Peta on set. You guys had Peta on set. Yeah, make sure that the puppies were totally fine. Peta signed off, said thumbs up. These puppies were not harmed in any way. And then <laughs> after the fact, PNG was still concerned that they would be in trouble. And so the puppies were made to be CG puppies. We shot real puppies, but those puppies are computer puppies. Is that what happened? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Just to, it, that's, it's crazy. that's commercials. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that I think is interesting about that one, and it's a technique that you can use in, in 15s is kind of uh, what's happening here like building curiosity at the front of, you know, where, okay, we're on a beach. Where's that voice coming from? Wait, what's coming out of the sand? Oh, wait, how, how's he coming out of the sand? Okay. That's Isaiah. He's coming out of the sand. And then, uh, and then the additional twist, you already had a twist of a guy coming out of a sand saying a funny line, but then, when you think that's probably all enough, of course you got to push it to the edge of madness and open up the guitar and have puppies inside. Yeah, I actually think another thing these Old Spice 15s do well, like uh, lesson they teach, now that I think about it, is that uh, 
you know, it's it applies to any commercial you're making, but I think especially in 15s is that why would you ever do something that's just uh, dialogue based? The whole thing can be dialogue and the dialogue should be interesting and cool and amazing and hilarious. But when you're making TV commercials, you're given you're given a chance to show people something amazing or unexpected or wild or different or, you know, unimaginable. Right. So that that, you know, these Old Spice ones do a great job of incorporating, a, you know, breakthrough visual gag with funny dialogue throughout, you know, which I think just makes it a lot stickier and a lot more effective. If you're enjoying this content and would like me to continue to do interviews like this, please take a moment right now to subscribe and hit the little notification bell so that you're notified when new episodes drop. I also think one of the things, <clears throat> this is not necessarily unique to a 15, but speaking of dialogue, one of the things that you and Craig did on occasion, you weren't overly literal about the dialogue. I think one of the things that make, I'm thinking of that spot. I'm also thinking of the Isaiah spot with the Komodo dragon. Ladies, can I take you to the freshest of distant cultures? No, but Komodo can, and it will, and I will too. So will you? I hope so. I know so. Ice cream? Okay. It's kind of gibberish uh, dialogue. You let yourself uh, be free of, of being so literal. It still makes sense, and it's still accomplishing what it needs to in the end, but you go about it in a kind of fresher, more interesting way by having the dialogue be kind of weird and unexpected. Totally, totally. Yeah, the, the dialogue is crazy as the visuals, right? Yeah. Speaking right, of, I'm... let's watch that Terry Crews one. Let's Actually, watch you watch the... it while I use the restroom really quick. Okay. Odor blocker body wash is so powerful it can block BO for 16 hours. It's so powerful it can turn off the sun, but then it gets too cold, so it makes another sun. Double sun power! You know, watching the Terry spot, it's it's again a reminder of what you said before. Like, a, any great commercial is a really simple idea. And sometimes when we struggle to write a 15, it's because we don't have a simple enough, strong enough idea. And that yes. might... Sometimes we have a good idea, but it just... It literally requires a longer format to tell the story. But often... It may be that you don't have a you don't have that great of an idea. You don't have yep. an interesting enough idea. I mean, the Terry spot. Obviously, we have a great character, and it's just a stupid, simple idea that this product yep. is so it turns off the sun, but then it gets cold, so then he makes a double sun, and then that makes the world blow up. Like, yeah, I think you. I think spokes people characters are fantastic for fifteens. Um, Simple messages are fantastic for 15s, like the Little Caesar stuff I used to do with either about how it's hot and ready to go, no calling, no waiting, or $5, right? One or the other. That is the one RTB we are going to sell you in this 15, right? Um, or also, if it's not a spokesperson, I mean, I think it needs to be just simple. Just a simple construct, you know what I mean? Just a, a setup, payoff, boom, done. All right, I'm going to finish watching this cast, and then we're going to talk about why you think this works. One hot and ready pizza, five dollars. Ah! Get a hot and ready pepperoni pizza for five dollars, or a deep, deep dish for eight, only at Little Caesars. Pizza, pizza. Okay, so first of all, <laughs> right off the bat, uh, t tell us about your your approach to saying exactly what the client wants you to say? Um, well, I would, I would uh, say that uh, I thrive in environments where there is direct information to communicate, uh, whether that be a price point or, you know, being the fastest or being, you know, if it's a simple, clear thing to communicate, uh, for me, you don't need more than 15 seconds, right? Because you, you're just going to make that point in the most memorable way possible. Um, on Little Caesars, I think it is the best, if you go through the years of it, that uh, you know, I was lucky enough to get to work on it. It is the best collections of 15s, I think, ever. 
or at least up there that I've ever been a part of. And the yeah. reason why was going into it, we found out we had 15 seconds and we found out that the last, we weren't going to sign it off in three seconds, that we had six seconds of pizza footage uh, and voiceover and information that we had to communicate. Um, and that was going to, it was already filmed by Little Caesars. It was going to play as the last six seconds of these. So we were writing nines. Uh, <laughs> and that's why it's so good. Because I think all the creatives got into the routine and the mindset of like, set it up, pay it off. You know what I mean? Like $5 pizza, this happens. It's hot and ready, so this happens, you know? And then it just turns into a writing exercise where obviously it would take 150 uh, written to get to one as good as cast. Um, but people, you know, everyone happily did because, you know, it was such a great reward yeah. to be a part of any of these 15. So Yeah, I mean, it's a great point. This is beyond a 15. This is a, this is a nine. Like They're nines. All the Little Caesars 15s are nines. And I'm telling you, that's why it's good because it, it forced all of the uh, all of the creatives who are concepting to write the most condensed stories ever. So it was similar to writing like a uh, Mitch Hedgeberg or Rodney Dangerfield set up payoff joke. You know what I mean? There is zero time wasted. It's like a uh, it's like joke from Concentrate. Yes, <laughs> and and you you start off by literally saying. The product benefit is the first. It's the first thing in this spot. It's the first thing out of the mouth. Well, never, d never shy away from that. Ne in in any advertising, I think uh, any good ad, uh, you know, is all about the story, the entertainment, the laughs, the emotion, whatever it is, should be all about that brand and all about that product or service. I, I never tack stuff onto the end. You're just making a less effective ad and a less ownable ad, right? You want to make it all about this brand and this brand's DNA, whatever that tone is. You know, for Little Caesars, it's wacky. And then you want to go right at it. And you want to tell them that a pizza is only five bucks or pizza is hot and ready in as entertaining a fashion as you can. And in, in this case, what the, the formula, and we'll, we'll break down some other ones that use different formulas, but the formula of this is... Right off the bat, you're you're setting up the problem and the tension, which is it's five bucks. He reaches into his 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 pocket on the left side, and there's no money. So right then, you're like, your brain just goes, "Oh, what's he gonna do?" He's got. First of all, you're, you you've grabbed people's attention with a ridiculous cast that points upward. That's already a very awkward looking cast. So right off the bat, you've communicated to me something's weird here. Something is something is odd. I want to watch and see what's going to happen. Then he pulls the pocket out, and now you're like, oh, tension, problem, what's going to happen? And then that sets up the joke. And oh, yeah. I mean, quick setup, quick payoff. You know, healthy arm, no money, unhealthy arms, got to get into the pocket. Whoosh. Here's your hot and ready pizza. No calling? No waiting. There's no rules! Let's just start back on. There's one rule! Pick up a large, hot and ready pepperoni pizza for $5. Only at Little Caesars. Pizza, pizza. <laughs> it's good. It's good. The, uh, you know, it's... By the way, shout out to a Fantastic Creatives and now Fantastic Creative Directors, uh, Danny Gonzalez and uh, David Suarez, who are the creative team on... I would say the majority of all these uh, little Caesar spots we're watching. All right, let's watch Woods. Oh, Woods is great. I heard a deranged clown lurks in these woods. I heard Little Caesars has pizza for five bucks. You heard right! <laughs> Get a hot and ready pepperoni pizza for five dollars or a three meat treat for eight at Little Caesars. Pizza, pizza. <laughs> just so stupid. This next one, mime is hilarious this is just a i mean a tip that you know you give i'm sure all the time is show everything you think of because i remember when this creative team showed me a, set, a stack of scripts 30 scripts the last one with this mime script and they had highlighted it in microsoft word and put a cross through so they printed out the script 
but they had crossed it out <laughs> and left it on the bottom because they thought it might be too silly or too dumb. And they didn't guess understand. Which, they I mean, guess <laughs> which of the 30 scripts was the one that got made. They there didn't know such thing. They didn't understand the CD they were working with. <laughs> they thought anything was too dumb. All right, here we go. Nothing gets too dumb. Honey, how did you order a... Oh, right. With Little Caesars, you don't have to call. Dad got pizza? That's crazy. Pick up Little Caesars Hot and Ready Caesar Wings with your large $5 Hot and Ready Pizza tonight. Pizza, pizza. Uh, he's a half mime. He's a, he's a half mime kid. Inter mime marriage. That's right. Oh, and if you want to... I would say my favorite, personal favorite, 15... I ever got to be a part of, um, I think proved out how hard and long everyone worked and thought on these little Caesar 15s. It's the one called one more time. And literally think about how mathematical we got about it. We have nine seconds and we had a six seconds end card. So one time we were saying, what if we just started with the six second end card with the pizza? We're like, what would, what could we do then? And then we're like, Oh, we could do this. So watch one more time. Get a hot and ready deep, deep dish pizza for $8 or a large pepperoni for 5 only at Little Caesars. Pizza, pizza. One more time! Get a hot and ready deep, deep dish pizza for $8 or a large pepperoni for 5 only at Little Caesars. Pizza, pizza. <laughs> yeah. Stupid. We hit you up twice with it. So, um, yeah, that that's Little Caesars. The next three are the Jolly Rancher campaign. I don't know if you saw we did a couple years ago. Um, it's character based. It's got a Jolly Rancher. Why don't you watch him, Jason? Howdy, Honcho! Tell your palate to pony up for the perfect bunch of juicy flavor. It'll douse your mouth in downright deliciousness. <laughs> Jolly Rancher, it's time for a flavor ride! Hola, amigos! Saddle up on the fruitiest flavor your tongue has ever touched! A luscious line dance and linger on your lips all day long! <laughs> Jolly Rancher, it's time for a flavor ride! I never thought of a, 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 a... That's the first time you ever made me think of the name as actually being a rancher. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm telling you, keep it simple, right? It, good ideas, you know, good, like, constructs for campaigns aren't that complex, right? So it's called Jolly Rancher. What if we put a happy cowboy, a Jolly Rancher, on one and he rode it around like a bull? That's already a lovable deal. <laughs> now you can do anything you want with it. How did you shoot that? Was he? He was. We had a a big thing, the same shape as the Jolly Rancher, um, that was like a green screen, um, and then we shot it on a huge soundstage where the camera would literally like fifty yards away from him. Because it turns out when you shrink something down in frame. For it to look real and viable, you have to be as far away from him as it would be. So, like, for example, we shot, let's say, someone holding a Jolly Rancher, right? And in frame, that person's that big. So when we shot the little guy on it, we had to put the camera 50 yards back so that hmm. that ratio still worked out. Do you know what I mean? Because if, we yeah, yeah, yeah. if we were super close to the guy, then if when we cut him out and put him on there, he would feel a different quality. And that's that's apparently how the magic is made. Huh. I didn't do a very good technical that, explanation no, that makes, of that. That makes sense. Yeah, All right. Yeah. Let's, let's watch your brother. Oh. So wrong if you were maxing out on a bench press and got stuck, it can unroll itself and spot you like a friend with it lifting so much weight. You get you so excited. You yell, I love that food by the foot. Foot! It's a good one. Uh... Watch the other, watch the next one. Fruit by the foot is so long. If you saw someone you liked, you could put one in, in your mouth and let it unroll all the way over next to their mouth. And then they can decide they want to give you a tongue kiss true love. I love my fruit by the foot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those, those are, those are good. Yeah, those are a good lesson in, well, first of all, keep the idea simple, right? Fruit by the foot wanted to talk about their, uh, you know, the unique attributes, the shape right so the length of it so they just wanted people to be excited about the length the creative um on that campaign 
thought of these awesome, interesting visual scenarios. But then when it was time to go make them, we realized, you know, man, this will be interesting to look at, even if you don't have your volume on, right? It'll be great. But how else can we punch it up? How else can we, what can we add to it to just up it even more? So that's when we decide, why don't we just write an upbeat song to go with it? And then what did that song say? I don't know exactly what you're seeing. Um, so just, you know, another layer of humor over it kind of helped elevate it for sure. Yeah. I got one more. I got to watch here. These are Oh, great. don't watch Fruit Snail yet. Fruit Snail is the, my magnum opus, greatest oh. routine I've ever written. Okay. Do you want me to wait on that one? Yeah. I'll tell Let me tell you about Fruit Snail, Jason. This tell me my about favorite. Fruit uh, it, Fruit Snail, I think the, the lesson here is a little trick I use sometimes called Sing the Brief. Um, <laughs> They just wanted to talk, Fruit by the Foot just wanted to talk about their attributes, which is their length and their shape, their unique, unique shape that you can kind of play with when you eat. So we got a box of them. I unwrapped one and put it down in front of me. It looked like a snail. Um, and so then I wrote a song about that snail. Uh, something fun had to happen. So I said, well, this is the like teenager. So why don't we have, you know, a preteen who's or a teenager who's friends with the snail, uh, and then it needed an ending. So, uh, you know, at the end they eat it and the poor snail dies. So we made a few of these, but it's just so simple. I don't know for what reason, but it's, uh, I wrote these ones. So I, this is my personal favorite 15 I ever wrote. All right, I'm gonna watch this. All right. We're gonna watch this. My fruit snail is adorable. My fruit snail is red. My fruit snail's really growing up someday and might be wed. My fruit snail is dying. My fruit snail is dead. Food. <laughs> I love the, I love the the little sting on the end of all of these. Uh, yeah, you got to get to that that guy who's singing it. The guy who's recording the song. Those are all. Those actually add a lot to the spots. Just that unexpected, like ha the the yeah. rest of the story. Well, that's a good. That's also probably another good lesson. Is like uh, even when you got the core of the idea, how else can you add to it? How else can you add humor? How else can you add energy? How else can you add breakthrough to it? Right. So it's uh, you know, once you have your idea, you know, if your CD likes it or whatever, maybe just think about it for a little bit. How can you? One up it. How can you plus it? There's always a way, whether it's a little detail in something visual, whether it's audio, whether it's adding a song, your own song, whether it's a crazy, fun, interesting opening or closing. Just, uh, you know, you have 15 seconds, might as well try to max it out. Yeah. That's what I call pushing it to the edge of madness. Push you it to the edge of madness. You got to always. I would suggest. That you got to always see how far you can push it before it goes over the cliff. Um, when you do this, sing the brief, do you, are you sitting in your office literally singing or are you singing in your head and writing? How does that work? Uh, I literally kind of sing usually when I'm driving or in my office alone. Um, I play, I play piano my whole life. So I happen to be musical. So I, I like to think I'm good at it, um, but though I think the worst thing you can do is be like, oh, let's do a cool song. And then literally most creatives present it where it's like an ad for, I don't care, I don't know what, beef jerky. And then what do you hear? An awesome song about beef jerky. It's like, what is that song? What are the words? What does it sound like? So I always get every song I present to a client made Actually, the song is written and recorded by a music house um, before I even share it with client. Um, it's actually led to, I, I don't know how I can find them, Jason, but like a treasure trove of songs I presented for all kinds of brands that campaigns that never sold. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I think, I mean, it says a, a good song is as specific as like a good joke, right? So you can't just present a script and be like, and then there'll be a funny joke. You say that you read the joke. Same thing with a song. You need to, you need to flesh out the song in the lyrics and kind of the style and the tone. So, uh, I always just go ahead and make a song, be, you know, before I've even presented it to the clients, just because it gets to your head. It'll the only way to get their head around it 
So how do you do that? Like I, I've done the same thing, but I'm curious when you do it, uh, are you have reaching out to music houses and are you paying them? Are they, ju- are they doing like a demo or are they? Uh, doing- yeah. In my case, yeah. In my case, I, I work with the same creative partners often. So in my specific case, I've been, uh, you know, I've worked with uh, one specific music house and one composer for my entire career and we uh you know get along great and he's uh we've made a lot of great work together and so he's always enthusiastic to help like you know that remember the ragu campaign yeah i think that's probably the like when the creative we're all we're kicking around the idea of you know the whole idea there was let's treat ragu for kids like beer for adults like after a hard day of work (laughs) after a long day out on the ranch (laughs) <laughs> so we have kids going through their hard days, and after a hard day being a kid, pop open a can of ragu, right? And so, which is fantastic. Um, definitely, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe, probably, top five campaigns, uh, my favorite campaigns ever. Well, thank you. the uh, uh, The creative team on that one, uh, fantastic creative team. Um, you know, we knew. We we're going to do a, you know, kind of like a Western-ish, kind of like Bush beer type of song. Um, and they were writing lyrics to it. Um, and they would sing it kind of different every time. And once one of them sang it, and I'm like, that's it. Like, it just sounded perfect. You know what I mean? I'm like, that sounds just like one of those songs would sound. That's a perfect little melody. Get out your phone now. Get out your phone. Get out your phone. And I made him get out his phone and record it right then. Um, and that's what we sent to the music house. Just because I don't know, just like when you, I don't know, just like when you hear it, you hear a great campaign construct or you, you hear a great joke, you're like, oh, that's it. That's the joke. Kind of the same thing happens, at least with me, with the songs. So, yeah, the, the uh, co- uh, copywriter actually wrote the actual melody on that one. It's so good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> speaking of the Ragu campaign, one of my favorites is actually uh, one of the radio spots. Yes. Uh, the... Who knew your mom was a socialist commie? Yeah, 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 yeah. That was amazing. Amazing. Uh, this is incredible. I'm gonna try to put it in right here so you can enjoy it, even though it has nothing to do with 15s. Mom, Lisa's playing with my toys. You know we share in this house. Ugh. Oh. You gotta share all your stuff, according to mommy. Who knew you were being raised by a socialist commie? She needs right. A long day of childhood calls for America's favorite pasta sauce. That one, I would say that campaign is just like Little Caesars 15s. Um, that campaign is a testament to just uh, writing and writing and writing. The creative team, uh, just on radio alone, probably wrote 50 scripts to get to the three or four we, get, we made, you know? And that's for radio, which is often an afterthought to TV. Yeah. But uh, it just, you know, I know that's something you talk, everybody probably talks about a lot. But uh, it's, I feel like you need to say it now more than ever, though, because when we came up, Jason, you know, the nicest boss was one that was kind of a jerk. And we all stayed till late at night, every night, right? And now, luckily, uh, young creatives coming in are in a very a healthier spot. They get paid a lot more fairly. They get treated a lot more humanely, which is wonderful, but it does put the onus now on the creatives to push themselves, you know what I mean? As hard as they want and to also realize I don't have to stay late, maybe ever. I barely have to work any weekends. If you utilize that time, you'll think of more executions, you'll get better and you'll have more to share with your CD so you'll sell more work. So I think that's that's the one theme whenever I'm, talking to you know advertising students or young people in advertising i think it's an important point to make more than once yeah i i i feel like i'm a broken record on that point but i'd say like the the top three most important attributes of a great creative is be prolific be prolific and be prolific and there's there's just no i've never ever met including you, including Craig, 
every great creative that I have ever worked with has been incredibly prolific. And there's no reason you can't be prolific working yes. regular hours. You don't have to work late. And most of us waste a ton of time. Yeah. And if we just use our days efficiently and especially prioritize our creative time, our creative concepting time, and don't put ourselves in meetings when we are at our most, if you're the most, if your most prolific time is from like 8 a.m. to noon, don't take a bunch of meetings from 8 a.m. to noon every day. Yeah, yeah. Like, try to block that time and be prolific. And, and you, if you do that, you should, you don't, you don't have to work the crazy hours that we worked. No, but, not at all. And I, I think it's just, you know, just be, be honest with yourself, like stay off social media at work, <laughs> stay off video games or whatever, you know, your time wasters at work and just make yourself do the work. Um, that's why it's kind of the perfect situation, right? Like you can leave at a normal hour now as a creative. It used to not be true. Um, so exactly say, hey, you know, and uh, there were days, Jason, when you and I were coming up where we would waste some hours because we were sick of concepting and we knew we had to stay late anyways because everyone had to stay late. But now creators are in the perfect position where just, you know, if it's an important project, I would put it this way. You could leave it for because you've had a week to work on this and you already have a lot of good ideas. But is it going to ruin your personal life? And is it going to ruin everything else if you just crank tail six? You know what I mean? Just put that little bit of extra concentration and time and work on it. You'll come up with 15% more ideas and, uh, you know, do that a handful of times and you'll have sold more campaigns. Yeah, you're going to have a much higher rate of, of being the team that sells the idea if you're the most. Yeah. And then you're going to make more work and then you're going to make more money and then everything, everything is just going to avalanche a, a glorious positive avalanche from there if you just yeah it'll pay off it, it'll the hard work always pays off and there's times when and i've seen it now being a boss of young creators for a while um i've seen you know it takes a while to get your head around it too right and like to get it so i've seen creative teams push themselves hard for a couple years and still not have success and i encourage them to keep going and then all of a sudden boom avalanche you know they sell three campaigns in a row in a couple months. You know what I mean? And then they're, they get to do all that fun stuff, flying all over the place, filming stuff, making great work, filling up their reel. So uh, it's just, it, it'll all pay off. Just keep, you know, bugging, ask your creative director why something was good or not all the time and just keep cranking and you'll get yourself there. It's kind of the, what, you know, Malcolm Gladwell talks about the, I don't think he was the one to invent this, but the 10, no, 10,000 hours. I talked about it in a, I talked about that exact thing in an ad speech thing I gave Jason. This is funny. You brought that up. So this is something that Craig and I actually did. Cause that book came out when we left Shiat and went to widen. Um, and basically our time at Shiat, New York, we were able to get fantastic, you know, that skittles work and some other stuff out of there uh, but it was the definition of a grind you know and it was like we worked from like nine in the morning till nine at night five days a week and then saturday and sunday we had folding chairs we took to central park and we sat them where our cubicle chairs would be facing each other and rode all day outside to get some vitamin d or whatever i mean we worked 24 uh, 7 like and when we uh left to go to widen we wrote so many scripts you know full ideas fully flushed out scripts that we presented to our creative directors not half-baked things or little things we threw out there uh we decided to count how many scripts we presented to make one skittles ad and for uh the last one we did pinata you know the pinata man um it was some i forget the exact number now but it was like 260 something 270 something scripts you know, oh over the uh, over a course. So that's how we and then when we were leaving Wyden, I was like, I was reading that Malcolm Gladwell book. And I was like, oh, my God, how many hours did I just work with Craig in these three years? I'm, I'm going to try to handicap it. So I was like this many days on the average weekday. Let's be honest about it. This many weekends. Let's be honest about it. And I did the math. It was totally rudimentary, but it came out to like 10,012 hours. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I think I did it on a plane after reading that chapter of that book. But it's like you have to put in some years and grind because 
uh, you know, being a creative and thinking of concepts and writing ad campaigns is something you only learn by doing. It's like throwing darts at a dartboard, right? The first time you do it, you don't even hit the dartboard once. But then over time and practice, you get, you know, you get closer and closer and closer until you've been doing this for 500 years like you and me. And we finally have our heads around it. But it's just uh, that's the only way to learn. There's not like there's not a cheat code. So it's just yeah. important stuff. And, and, and the sooner that's where the being prolific comes in because you're going to get to that 10,000 hours quicker. It's not about how much time you clock at the office. It's yeah, yeah, how, yeah. Much, how much time do you spend actually mastering your craft and practicing it? Yes. And the, the sooner you get to it, you know, there's a, people are, are very uh, almost allergic to talking about like hard work and putting in the time and, and we're, we're not sitting here saying like, oh, we're, we, it was unhealthy the amount of hours that you and I worked in our early Yeah, it was bad. It was we okay. we're, we're not recommending that. But the, the reality is we did get to that 10,000 hours qu- quickly. And you can do that n- not working till 9 p.m. every night. But you got yes. to hit it. You got to like make sure that you're cranking and being prolific when you're at work. And... And you're going to, it's going to pay off so massively. And the quicker you can do it, the, the better, the more benefits your career is going to have. And like you yes. said, don't, don't get down. If in the early part, you feel like you're really grinding and you're not having all the success because it will come, it'll come, it'll come soon enough. And some people, some people, and this is just for everybody listening. Some people, it doesn't come till their second or third jobs. A lot of times I know creatives who, you know, everybody has their voice, their style or whatever, um, you know, and creative directors, you know, react maybe to the tone and style of some creatives more than others. So I've seen people work hard in their first job for two years, not have much of any luck, go to a second job for a year, year and a half. Same thing. They're getting really frustrated. Then they find they go to their third job. They're working for that right CD. And then boom, it's explosion. You know, world opens up. They're doing amazing work tons of it and then i've seen people struggle for a couple jobs like that and then go from creative to acd to cd to even higher than that in a matter of just a few years that just like you know it took a few years to get here and find that right fit and then boom shoot up so it's uh it's funky should we watch uh, take five and sure take five last ones i threw on there at take five you stay in your car because we're faster than you think my oil change is done. I didn't even finish my coffee yet. Take five to stay in your car, 10 minute oil change. At take five, you stay in your car because we're faster than you think. Oil change is done. That was so fast, I didn't even have time to finish knitting these sweaters. Oh well. Cheese! Take five to stay in your car, 10 minute oil change. At take five, you stay in your car because we're faster than you think. Oil change is done. Gosh, I don't even have time to stretch my legs. Guess you have to do it at home. Guess I'll have to do it at home. Take five to stay in your car, 10 minute oil change. So the, the take five spots are, are wonderful. And they kind of, um, I didn't go to portfolio school. So my, my schooling was just reverse engineering everything I like. And I, I, I still do it. And so when I look at the take fives, the formula for that is state the product benefit right up front, which is the same thing you do on Little Caesars. Product benefit, there's, there's this benefit, therefore there's this negative outcome. Yeah, yeah. So it's just, I mean, you know, they're, they're the fastest uh, oil change. And so... Once we came up with the faster than you think construct, then, I mean, now you can have a field day and any creative can write hundreds of these, you know? So it's just a matter of uh, cracking that campaign construct that uh, lets you repeat and repeat and repeat in memorable ways forever. And, and you know, all the jokes, all the jokes just drive home the RTB. That's, and I, 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 I love how you found a way to use RTB in this conversation. It, uh, you it, hate it, it? It elevated everything. I love it. Um, but do you, in in the three that we just watched, 
the the product benefit results in a harmless but negative outcome. Yes. So the guy has to pour coffee all over himself. The woman has knit sweaters that are only cover half the body. The guy yeah. has to do his, his stretches at home. And why is it is it necessarily that the negative outcome is just funnier and more surprising than than because it could be a positive out it could be a ridiculous positive outcome? Uh, yeah, I think it's it's partly that it's it's that the I mean you know faster than you think you, when you start writing the jokes it all comes down to thinking of you know examples of things done in way less time so how could that be funny you know knitting a sweater you only go halfway down uh, sipping your coffee now you have to chug it. Uh, so it just, I think it naturally, uh, lends itself to that negative outcome. But I would also say that, you know, it's, it's not, I mean, it's negative for that character in the commercial, but it really does drive home the point, right? We're yeah, demonstrating positive. how fast it is. The message so, is positive. It's just, yes, you, exactly. Uh, funny. I would think that it just happened. It, just the way that works, it's probably usually going to be funnier to show a, a kind of negative outcome for the for the character in the spot in that case yes yes it, it is i think we've had a few that try to turn into positive but it's funny because then it usually gets too long because you set up fat it's the same thing it's like little caesars you set it up faster than you think you have like eight seconds and then end card right so again we're writing like eights after you set up the construct so you show someone you know doing something in a condensed time than what it usually takes, therefore they fail or something is different or wrong, then they have to flip, that has to be flipped into a positive, which you can do, but it just is almost like an extra step that eats up your time. So I believe, uh, yeah, I believe that's why, if I'm remembering, that's why most of them end up in a, you know, an over the top, yeah. you know, bad thing, even though it's great for the brand and for our purposes. Do you have any thoughts or advice or techniques on how to do sixes? Like sixes, if brands let you have fun with sixes, it's the best because it's you don't even have to set something up and pay it off. You just have to do the most memorable thing uh, that you can think of to do, whether that be a noise <laughs> or a fragment of a sentence. With these starfish ones for Fruit Gushers, uh, we had, that was the end card of the spots and we had the little starfish saying something. So we had the footage so we could put whatever we wanted in its mouth and then just manipulate, you know, animate the mouth opening and closing that I think are some of the funnest stuff I've ever been a part of. I think you especially would appreciate them because of how next level silly they are. But um, yeah, I don't know. You just kind of, uh, kind of let go. I think tonight I'm gonna want a salad. Psych, I want those gushers, gush. I talk and fart out of the same hole. Gush. Gushers in my mouth hole. I love you, gush. It's less about telling a story and it's more about just like, how do you say something or get, give the brand some personality in the most ridiculous, memorable way, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's exactly, I mean, it's, it's how can you break through the most in six seconds? You have to be obnoxiously over the top, memorable, silly, fun. Yeah. Last question, Eric. Mm -hmm. Where did you, I, I think you have made a name for yourself with a, with a huge body of work that is very over the top. And I think I think very smart too, but over the top, and you're a great example of of the principle of pushing it to the edge of madness. Um, and I think it's what sets it what it's what makes your work great, and it's what makes it stand out. Where did that come from? Like, how did you? Because uh, not everybody does that naturally. Not everybody. Uh, yeah, that's. I mean, thank you. First of all, thank you. Second of all it's just stupid luck jason like my voice or tone as a copywriter my student book i think i'd probably unhireable except for the cds on skittles 
because it was like it was for 10 different brands if you flip through all the ads but um they were all over the top and wild and maybe didn't make sense but were right right for that brand right so uh it was just i mean i i tried really hard to get that interview and get that meeting and get in there um but like i think it's wild luck that uh you know that uh i don't know my natural tone or voice or sensibilities lean towards your description there i guess edge of madness pushing it you know turn it up to 11 or whatever it may be um because and i'm just lucky that that's proved out in real life to be what really you know leads to luckily effective advertising stuff that actually breaks through and gets remembered so i would say it's just it's just dumb luck with how did my, you have the act- confidence how did you have the confidence as a coming out of portfolio school to to have such a polarizing portfolio as opposed to trying to like oh i'm going to i'm going to it sounds like you did what i did but 3 years into my career yeah where i was like i'm just going to make what i love and i know it's yes. going to turn people off but i'm going to have faith that it's going to attract the type of work i want to do so i'm just going to do it but you did that you know at the as a student basically yeah. was that conscious uh, yeah, yes, it was in the fact that like there were the people who were like writing ads, maybe like I won't, don't want to say imitating other ads, but they made sure I had my thoughtful long copy. Now I had my smart headline campaign. Now I had my funny headline campaign, which makes a lot more sense, really, <laughs> and probably opened you up to a lot more career opportunities. So it's definitely might not be the wrong thing to do. Um, I guess I was just overly excited uh, when I got the stuff that I thought was, you know, like what we're talking about, maybe louder, bombastic, over the top, whatever it is, right? Crazier. Um, and I just loved it. And I, I just wanted to do stuff like that at the beginning. I mean, if I went to ad school now, <laughs> I probably would be like, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> no, I think it's a great idea. And it, it it's like, that was the best testimonial that I've had of what I, a principle that I just totally believe in, which is, first of all, figure out what you love, like what gets you excited. And that's your yeah. best indication of what your voice is. Yeah. And then lean 100% into that. And, and I, I actually give people that advice. I give young, anybody, I don't care if you're young or not. I think your book should be a little bit polarizing. It should oh, it not, definitely should be. It should definitely not appeal. Be. And when that does, whether it's comedy or whether it's maybe you have. 100%. 100%. Whatever you have, like, you should lean so far into it that not everyone's going to like it. And some people are going to love it. But it'll get you hired by the right person. Someone who yes. likes what you're doing will say, I want that. And so as a creative director, I always complain about going through too many books look the same, right? Like. Uh, one thing is there's only a few big ad schools, so everyone has the same teachers or CDs. But then also, you know, like I was saying, they all have their long copy. They all have their smart visual campaign. They all have their snarky headline campaign, whatever it is. And then you can't you can't tell what they're really like until they've been working for you for, you know, I don't know, six months, right? Then you've got your head around what this creative is and what they do and how they think and all that. And uh, man, would it be helpful if people just unabashedly went for putting together the portfolio that they personally love, um, whether that be, you know, every ad is a thousand words of the most beautifully written romantic copy you've ever read or the craziest, wackiest visuals you've ever seen. Just, you know, if everyone said, kind of said, screw it, I'm just going to do what I, I'm going to share the ads I love then uh, I think it would, yeah, I think it'd definitely be positive. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I know you got to go. Thank you for, uh, thank you for sharing your, your insight. I know people appreciate it. Are you an advertising creative or creative director? And despite all your hard work, you're still not making the kind of creative you want. Well, I know what it's like to be frustrated that you aren't getting better creative opportunities, feeling like you're falling behind your peers and not getting the support you need. Using a specific seven step process, my teams and I have been able to win major advertising awards every year for 20 consecutive years. 
If you would like to learn the exact same seven-step process my teams and I use to create iconic campaigns for Old Spice, Nike, KFC, and others, and how you can start doing the best work of your life in less than 60 days, click the link somewhere on or around this video, and it'll take you to a page where you can register for a completely free online training I put together for any creatives wanting to do the best work of their life. So go ahead, click the link on or around this video, and register for the free training, and I'll see you there.